the vast information that you need to make your decisions on the Bay about this issue of mass incarceration and recidivism in Brooklyn. So we, are, we would like to start with a prayer with Pastor Jim Belisair, who's going to um, lead us in prayer. Oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise in your name for today. We thank you, O oh God, for your goodness, and we thank you, O oh God, for your mercy. Truly, your mercy endures forever. Heavenly Father, every work that we set about to do, we set about to do, putting it in your hands, committing it to your way and to your word and to your will, asking for your power and asking for your strength, asking for your wisdom and asking for your guidance. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everybody that's gathered here under the sound of my voice. We pray that your blessing would be upon this meeting. We pray that those that we come to serve and those that we come to help would know that on the outside there is there are people that are gathered and that are concerned for them and concerned for their welfare and the future of them and their families. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. 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 One of, the th one of the things I'd like to share as a faith reflection with all of you all uh, tonight is that in the Bible there was the patriarch Joseph and Joseph asked some people that were in prison with him to remember him. And I want you all to know that uh, there's always the cry of the prisoner to be remembered. There's always the cry of the families to be remembered. There's always the cry of the friends to be remembered. And Joseph was actually forgotten for two years but then he happened to fall upon the memory of somebody else. And because he fell upon the memory of somebody else, he came out and he did great things. Even from a dungeon, even from a prison cell, even from drinking water and eating bread as a diet, somebody remembered him. And because somebody remembered him, he went out and did great things. And tonight we gather so that we might remember those that are in need. God Amen. bless So we have a moderator that will um, moderate this forum tonight. Um, I want us to welcome Pastor Roderick Sherry from be the coordinator for the Haitian Assembly, um, Haitian Pastors Association. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Of, of Brooklyn for 28 years um, and the pastor of Grace Tabernacle Evangelical Church located at 421 Torrey Street in Brockton and also I'm the coordinator of the Asian pastors in Brockton and we're working together to make Brockton better. It's a great privilege to be the moderator for tonight and, uh, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you for tonight. And uh, our goals for this evening is to educate uh, the public about uh, our recidivism that affects our community. And also we're here to hear from the candidates about uh, uh, their visions and goals. And also to discuss the uh, candidates' plan for successful re-entry for those getting out of jail. And also to look at the candidates' plan for uh, transparency, accountability, as it relates to uh, the community. And also the last goal is to confirm the every vote counts. One minute to introduce yourself. First of all, I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, Vicky? Vicky. 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 Okay, to introduce himself in one minute. My name's Scott Becky. I'm the, I'm the Democratic candidate for sheriff this year. I'm a retired gunnery sergeant of Marines with 23 years of policing corrections experience, and I'm also an attorney. When I came back from Fallujah, Iraq, and was retired, the VA sent me to law school. I was very fortunate in that aspect. I don't practice law. I use it to do my job better every day. As a police officer in the town of Plymouth, I respond daily to the horrors of domestic violence, the opiate epidemic, and many of our social ills. I've been fighting this battle for 20 some odd years. Way back when the opiate epidemic was confined to cities like Brockton, and Boston, and Dorchester, and Roxbury, 
And I've been on the front lines of this battle every single day. And I truly believe, as the only true law enforcement candidate in this election cycle, that I have the experience to effectively lead the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department and work to solve these difficult problems that are ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Joe McDonald. I appreciate uh, the invitation to come over here uh, and to talk to you, to introduce myself. I am your Plymouth County Sheriff. I have been the Sheriff for the last 12 years. Uh, prior to my uh, coming into the Sheriff's Office, I was an Assistant DA here in Plymouth County for a period of nine years. Uh, before that, I worked for a while as, uh, uh, as a defense lawyer, and before that, I worked uh, in the mental health field. So it's my, uh, my great pleasure to be here. Uh, I look forward to, um, to hearing more so. I mean, oh, you guys want to hear what it is that we, the candidates, have to say, and that's very important. But something my grandfather said to me many years ago, and it stayed with me, was that God gave me two ears and one mouth, and he asked that I maintain the ratio. So I know that education goes both ways. So I am here not simply to talk, to tell you about myself, because I'm happy to do that. I've got a 12-year record as your sheriff, which I'm very proud of. But I'm here to listen and to hear what it is that you have to tell me. So for that, I appreciate it, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to talking to anybody that wants to talk to me tonight. So thank you very much. Vicky season for this meeting tonight, and uh, many of you know about Vic. I've been a big um, leader for a long, long time since the Northwest was the um, leader uh, organizer for Vic. And uh, we can't, we couldn't do it uh, without without Vic. And some of you don't know too much about Vic. This is the one that I'm going to call Barbara. Um, Barbara Wallace. She's the one who's going to talk to you about Vic. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm very excited to speak to you about Brockton Intimate Community, known as BIT. It's very exciting to be involved in a community um, program. I believe in social justice. I believe that change can happen no matter how big or how small. It's so important to listen to people. And Vic's manner is to sit down and look at issues and say, why is it done this way? What could be done better? Let's talk to the people and find out what they want to know and then have a plan of action. So it's not just sitting back and saying, oh gee, isn't it too bad that, um, let's just say, the application process has that, used to have that note about felonies, have you been convicted for felonies the last five years? Why can't that be changed? Why can't everyone have a chance to get a job, to make a difference, to provide for their family? Why not? So Vic says, yes we can. This is a congregation, uh, a group of congregations, 19 total right now. Certainly if anyone's interested in more information, we'd like you to join us. But we believe that God is in charge. We believe that everyone is important. Everyone's story is important. We all have our own stories. Our members will certainly uh, share with you some of their stories. They're all different, but yet we're all the same. We love Brockton. We love our state. We love our country. So if you'd like to have more information, please see Isabel. One of us will be glad to, uh, to give you uh, some more information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mara. And right now that we have the privilege to uh, introduce to the job Nat Shells, Campaign. We have the privilege to call um, Gali Emil, who's going to talk about 
uh, jobs, not job. That's for Paul Gallo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Garley A. Mill. Uh, before I tell you about the jobs, not jails, I'd just like to share with you my brief story. Um, I'm a combat veteran, um, Global War on Terrorism Ribbon Awardee, uh, Army Accommodation Medal recipient. Um, I'm also recovering from uh, PTSD and some other issues that I've dealt with. Um, I'm currently in rehab right now. Um, and I also have a quarry. And I'd just like to tell you how difficult it's been for me to just get a job. I mean, through the big, org uh, through the big organization, I'm able to at least get my foot through the door with an application process because I don't have to put that I'm a felon on, a, on an initial application. At least I get the chance to speak to an interview before, you know, potentially getting denied. But big just makes it that more accessible for me to find employment. Uh, currently, right now, I'm still unemployed, but uh, it's, 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 it's difficult because of my of my of my quarry. Like I have, like I'm waiting on two background checks right now. Um, but that's enough about me. <laughs> um, I like to tell you about. Uh, jobs not jails. This coalition working uh, affecting criminal justice legislation. Big is also an affiliate of um, MCAN, the Massachusetts Community uh, Action Network. And as a coalition, we voted for among a number of possible initiatives that we will bring to our allies in the Jobs Not Jails Coalition to be considered as legislation to seriously reduce incarceration, increase jobs and access to treatment and safety. As a community, we agree to advocate for the expungement of juvenile misdemeanors and some felony records, increase access to pretrial diversion for mental health and substance abuse treatment, to increase funding for reentry programs for ex-prisoners, and to increase access to programs in prisons as well as access to good time that leads to reduction in sentence. In addition, we will mobilize around increasing the number of public defenders to those with charges that they have ad adequate representation. Um, locally, BIC formed a Jobs Not Jail Committee to conduct research and craft a set of concrete demands on the above issues that I just stated. We have been busy meeting with key stakeholders such as the District Attorney, Chief of Probation, Department, Public Def uh, Defenders, Department of Youth Services, and the Sheriff, and uh, agencies that play a, a key role in the criminal justice system. BIC together with the Jobs Not Jails Coalition will plan a public action in December at the State House that will focus on asking Governor Baker, Speaker DeLeo, Senate President Rosenberg, and Chief Justice Gantz to include our priorities in their bill that they, we will file in January. And we also encourage you to come out and support us as well. We need as much support as we can. Um, we welcome you to join us in these efforts that as we mo mobilize collectively to create real criminal justice reform that reduces mass incarceration and recidivism. These efforts are about battering lives in society and bringing bettering lives in society and dignity to people like me who, are, have, who have paid their debt to society and are trying to reintegrate into the system. Um, I just thank BIC and I'm a proud member of what this organization has to do and we need your support. We encourage you to come out and support us. Thank you very much. Yes, now we have some questions. We have uh, a group of um, four people who are going to ask questions. They have two minutes each. Uh, the first question that we're going to call is Reverend Rachel. She's going to come forward and she's going to ask the question that she has. I will say that I, I do love Brockton, even though I'm representing a suburban church, the first parish church in the town of Brussels and Bridgewater. But we are very concerned um, with what goes on in Brockton. Personally, I worked for um, eight years in the city planner's office with David Crosby, and so uh, and I lived in Brockton for a number of years. So Brockton is close to my heart. Um, and those, um, I am very concerned about reforming the prison system and ending mass incarceration, which is so skewed against people of color in particular. Some members of my congregation volunteer at the Old Colony Correctional Center in Bridgewater in a Read to Me Father program, and they've witnessed the harshness of incarceration. Now, I know that the uh, county sheriffs don't oversee the state prisons like Old Colony Correctional Center, but I know that many of the issues are the same. 
So I know other churches experience prison war directly, often through their neighbors, even family members, church members, and friends. They see firsthand the lack of opportunities the Brockton and Plymouth County residents who are incarcerated, um, the lack of opportunities to get better, to reestablish healthy family connections, to get ready to return to their families and their communities. Our concerns include contractors who may not be held accountable to deliver the best services at the lowest cost, and prison staff who don't relate well to the prisoners due to race or cultural and language differences, often through ignorance, fear, and unconscious bias. We know that it's often an us versus them environment. We know that a racially and culturally diverse staff reflecting the population of those who are imprisoned is important for effective service delivery. So I believe, and others in BIC believe, that the public needs to really know what's going on in the Plymouth County Correctional Facility and how services are provided or aren't provided to prisoners. And we believe that the role of the sheriff demands transparency and accountability in this area. We are concerned that the best people are involved in providing crucial services, whether they are staff paid directly by Plymouth County or indirectly through contracts. So my questions to you are really in two parts. What are your plans for reporting and ensuring that the public have a fair and equitable bidding process for contracts and service providers? And what are your plans for diversifying the workplace at the Plymouth County Correctional Facility? Okay, um, Sheriff McDonald, would you answer that first? Certainly. We're, um, I'll answer your question. Uh, it's two parts. Dealing with right. the first with reference to the, uh, the bidding and the contract awarding. Uh, that is done in accordance with state law. There are many, many contracts there uh, for equipment, for, uh, for services that are provided. But if you're specifically referring to, uh, well, all contracts in general are in accordance with procurement law, uh, Massachusetts state procurement law. Uh, if there's a particular contract you're referring to. Um. The people who, who came up with this question, I'm, I'm not sure. I would okay. think it would be direct service providers. Okay. okay. Well, you know, for, for us, uh, most of our program services that we have inside the correctional facility are provided by our staff. Okay. Uh, and with reference to uh, the diversity of our staff, we're very proud of the staff that we have down there for many, many reasons. Uh, their professionalism, their levels of education, their dedication uh, to providing the highest quality program services. I'm very blessed in that sense. I have a wonderful staff to fall back on. Now, with reference to uh, contract providers, we also do use contract providers uh, for certain services in there. Program services, I'm imagining, is what we're most curious about here. Uh, we, uh, at the Plymouth County Correctional Facility, uh, about a year ago, a year ago in August, started something uh, that is unique uh, in any correctional facility. We are taking the overflow uh, from the MASAC in Bridgewater. So people that are committed uh, under Section 35 for drug or alcohol use are able to come to us uh, for drug treatment. And we don't have the staffing to provide that. So what we've done is we have looked to the Department of Corrections to provide that through their contractor. Uh, other than that, most of those services are provided, as I said, but we have a couple of uh, um, vocational services. We have a janitorial uh, service that is contracted to come in and help inmates learn uh, building maintenance, and those inmates that learn the building maintenance trades are finding jobs. We're happy to report that there are two individuals who have just gotten jobs uh, through that service. Okay, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Just a reminder that this committee has two minutes to answer the question. Okay. Two minutes. Thank you. The, uh, the first thing I'd like to address is, uh, is the issue with vendors and staff. 
And one of the main concerns that I have with uh, what's going on with the County Sheriff's Department revolves around campaign contributions, specifically from vendors and employees. There's a concern with the quantity of money that's going around down there that we're putting the correct people in these positions, that the people have the qualifications to hold the positions, caseworkers, direct inmate care, all that other stuff, and that the vendors we're using are not being influenced by an outrageous amount of campaign contributions that have been received. I believe we should take money out of politics and money out of the prison system. And I personally have sworn that I will not accept employee campaign contributions or vendor campaign contributions just for that reason, to ensure that when I am sheriff, that everybody knows that people got where they were on merit and qualifications, especially the vendors that are providing services. I know I have only two minutes, so I'll talk about diversity. It's joked that I'm an honorary citizen of Brockton because I spend so much time here talking to all of the residents, even people who were inmates. We've had wonderful conversations. And while the sheriff does have a good staff, a professional staff down there, and it may represent the diversity of the county, it definitely doesn't represent the diversity of the population incarcerated there or the command staff. And I, I only have two minutes, but I would at some point like to talk about my community service deputies program to reach out to the communities of color, especially those in Brockton and Wareham, and ensure they're aware of all the job opportunities that exist at the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department. So that the, the diverse staff represents not only the diversity of the county, but of the population they serve in the incarcerated population. Uh, the next person to ask questions to the candidates is um, Gauri, do you have a question? Okay, come up. Yeah, we can, you can ask the second question. Okay. I'd like to address the Trust Act, now under consideration by the Brockton City Council. At the present time, many city residents who are members of the immigrant community are afraid to get involved in any way in assisting law enforcement. They are victims of crimes uh, or they may be witness their neighbors being victimized. Due to this fear and mistrust, there is more crime in the city, more crimes against innocent people who are documented or not, whether they are documented or not. They are afraid of police asking about their papers and their immigrant status before they're even asked about the crime. They're afraid that they might be turned over to ICE, certainly and detained and deported. The Trust Act in Brockton would greatly help in reducing crime. It would improve police community relations, increasing trust and cooperation. Similar acts have been passed in Boston, Cambridge, Sunnyville, Lowell, Lawrence, and Springfield, and have worked well in reducing crime. So how do you feel personally about the Trust Act being considered in Brockton? And are you in favor of it or against it? And will you support the uh, BICS efforts to have the Trust Act adopted by the city? Should we let Mr. Becky go first? Thank you. I've talked extensively with Council Rodriguez about the Trust Act. And I do believe that the decision on a Trust Act should purely be a Brockton decision made by the voters and residents of Brockton on how they want their city to run. But I do have some personal experiences with the things that we've talked about. Many of you don't know, but my wife is a naturalized citizen. She came from Poland when she was about 18 years old. We lived in the Polish Triangle in Dorchester when we first moved in together. And I saw immigrants that were afraid to report domestic violence. I saw people that were the victims of crimes that were afraid because of their immigration status. And sometimes it was simply because a batterer would say, I'll report you to the police. You'll get deported. So there are significant concerns that the Trust Act addresses. However, 
I haven't fully read the Trust Act proposed in Brockton, and I am not positive of how it would affect the Secure Communities Act and at what federal funding would be affected by the Sheriff's Department. Those are issues that I believe should be decided by the residents of Brockton. So I do understand, and again, we've talked extensively about it, and I have firsthand seen the reasons behind it. Whether or not the, city, the citizens of Brockton want it, I believe, is entirely up to them. But I do understand why they would want it. Thank you. Well, I too believe that the uh, decision on whether or not to adopt uh, the tr Trust Act uh, in, in any form rests with the citizens of the city that seek to do so. So I would never seek to impose my will, but I would welcome an opportunity to weigh in on specific provisions. I'd have to, as my uh, colleague has stated, I'd love to see what those provisions say uh, and perhaps opine at that time. But I will share some of my personal experiences as well. Uh, the Secure Communities Program that uh, was uh, somewhat controversial several years ago uh, is no longer uh, operating uh, in the United States. Uh, but I will say this, when I became uh, a prosecutor uh, 20 plus years ago, uh, my first assignment was in the Plymouth District Court. And in the Plymouth District Court, I had the opportunity to deal uh, with many people in the immigrant community in the Plymouth area. Uh, specifically, there were a large number of people in the Brazilian community. And I found them to be very nice, very hardworking, very honest people. The kind of people that you want as your neighbors, the kind of people that you want as U.S. citizens. But I also found, uh, as time went by, you know, they would come into court, we would deal with their cases, and they would get on with their lives, by and large. But the problem with that community was they were scared of so much. They didn't use the banking system. Their money was kept in cash. Uh, they were afraid to operate in the, in the economy in the light of day. They were an underground economy, if you will. But the most troubling thing to me was I saw a second wave of immigration uh, in the Brazilian community in Plymouth. And this second wave of immigration was decidedly unlike the first. They were not nice people. They were not hardworking people. And what they were doing is they were coming here because that's where their victims lived. And unfortunately, I saw all too many people victimized having all the cash that they had saved from their hard work stolen by the, essentially the bad guys from their home country who knew that those individuals would not avail themselves of the criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have some awards. Um, you have a vote of great for the candidates, both candidates who finished speaking before we're going to vote. Okay. Um, now, uh, the next person that we're going to call is Ronero Yemi. Ronero Yemi is the one who's going to uh, speak uh, to ask the question, the next question to the candidate. So.
And I, when Sunday is always when they call me there in jail or this and that, sometimes the story you hear is, is basically unbelievable. You say, I am responsible for all these kids. They're my kids. They're your kids too. This community is ours. As a member of Big Kido, I believe the church has a social mission also. We need to protect that. And every kid is important. Black, red, yellow, green, I don't care. All kids are important. Education is required for all of them. Healthcare is required for all of them. But when it's time to go to jail, we have to make sure we do the right things by them too, by teaching them that. Without further ado, I will ask question to our two candidates. And the question is, it's not about that, we're going to ask other questions again. Do you have a program for job placement and does it include a network of friendly or current employees for those who are in jail? When they come out of our city, they don't have to struggle and go back. In a way, what they do, their time, it should be done. We should not hold them as second class citizens or telling them they're not human or wipe them like hawks waiting for them to make mistakes. Once we train them, once we train them, they come out, we should be able to teach them again how to be society members again. Do you guys have such a plan? Uh, the question is for the quota of you. I would actually start with the sheriff for this day. He has a job now. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the, the short answer to the question is we, we do. We have very dedicated uh, program staff uh, in reentry, and our feeling is that the plan for reentry, we have, we're, we're very conscious of the fact that virtually everybody that's coming into a house of correction is coming back into our community. So we need to find a way to help those individuals deal with the problems that got them into that bad situation in the first place. And those may be substance abuse issues, those, you know, the various issues, mental health issues, medical issues are often dealt with in there as well. But I do agree, you hit upon a key point, that the most important thing to keeping or having people make a go of it on the outside is getting them employed in legitimate, reasonable, good jobs. Uh, to that end, our staff works very hard. We've had a number of uh, job fairs. We have life skills classes inside resume writing, we do uh, interview classes. Uh, we've got coming up on November 2nd, we have the most recent iteration of a job fair. The last job fair that we had several months ago, we had over 20 Corey friendly employers that, uh, that were there. I was able to come over and, and talk with a number of them and I thank them uh, very heartily for giving our inmates a chance. And uh, I would invite anybody that wants to come uh, and see what it is that we're up to over there at the Plymouth County Sheriff's Office. We give tours all the time, so please feel free to give us a call, come down and see. Thank you. For your approaches, what I'm going to be called, Mr. Thank you. And uh, in short, I would say, if we were doing a good job of it right now, we still wouldn't be asking this question 12 years later. The program I have, that I believe, is multifaceted. All right. One of which is a safety net in the communities, that I really want to involve the ministries, especially all of the churches of Brockton, in creating a safety net for the people when they come out. The other thing is with the substance abuse, to ensure that they're paired with sponsors. AA and NA are very, very effective programs because of sponsors. But we need to make sure that they're paired with sponsors before they go back up to, to this, where they came. Right now we're talking about Brockton. I work right next to the correctional facility, and I see these people, they get their $5 and they walk out and they walk up the street carrying their belongings and get on a bus and come back to Boston, Brockton with no safety net. The ministries would provide that safety net. As far as job training, we needed to focus on realistic job training that somebody with a quarry can attain. There are, I'd like to say I had all the wonderful ideas, but I, but I don't. I look around and I see what's working. If we look at Sheriff Tompkins in Suffolk, he went out and bought sewing machines to teach them tailoring so that the inmates can learn how to work in a tailor shop or at a cleaners or someplace doing alterations, a job that they can attain with a quarry. In addition to that, when I went to school, 
we had all a cart full of computers that we, that we pushed around. The, uh, the old DOS computers. Why can't we get a bunch of iPads on a cart? Bring them into the units. Teach them how to use LinkedIn. How to do online job training. Some of the OSHA stuff that's free. So they can actually build a real resume. And job search want these iPads from jail, so they're already applying for jobs before they get out. They're paid with the support network in the community, and they have a sponsor for their substance abuse issues. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's a great privilege to welcome back Gauri Emil, so he's going to ask the next question to both candidates. Having a quarry leaves you almost with a disability. Um, I've been out three years myself, and I've been able to accomplish a lot. Uh, just most recently, this past year, I graduated with my associate's degree, and I'm currently enrolled in school working on my bachelor's. Um, I just made a mistake. You know, I, I made a poor decision. I shouldn't have to pay for it for the rest of my life. Um, but where I'm at right now, um, I didn't get here by myself. Um, I was able to use the wealth of resources that the VA has to offer, and uh, similar to what BIC is doing for the public sector, which is offering information. Um, knowledge is power, as we all know. Um, inmates that don't know about resources and things like that, essentially they're blind, because they're just walking through life stumbling, uh, just, just bound to make the, the, the same mistakes that they, that they made that got them to the position that they were to, to, to begin with. And so I'm going to address this issue to um, uh, Mr. Becky. Is it? Is it? Uh, Vecchi or Vecchi? Vecchi, oh, I'm sorry. And, uh, but it's for both candidates. Um, how would you address the social, physical, mental health, and economic needs in relation to services for those re-entering society, and what follow-up would you provide? Thank you. That's a very good question, because I as well have been fortunate enough to be retrained by the VA, and they do offer a lot of resources for, for some of us. One of the things, uh, I'm adjunct faculty at Quincy College. I teach drugs in society and family violence on a recurring basis because I'm so familiar with those issues. Talking with the, the staff and the faculty at Quincy College, they actually have a, a program that, that they want to launch dedicated to incarcerated veterans. And I've been talking with the, with the, um, the Vice President for Academic Affairs over there about this program and about when I'm sheriff, how I want to see this off the ground as quickly as we can. The other thing is, Substance abuse and all of our social ills are an onion. There's no one answer. When I first became a police officer, I was somewhat naive and I thought we could arrest our way out of the drug problem. You can't. Enforcement is one part of it. But once you peel back that layer, there's a mental health component that we really need to intensively screen. We need to make sure that there's mental health counseling available inside, that we're identifying these inmates who need that counseling. And again, that the reentry coordinators are setting them up and telling them where places are. You know, I, I as well came back. I'm a combat veteran of Fallujah. And when I came back, as you know, it's a little bit much to be around places that you're not used to anymore. And you have to, and, you, and you're concerned about being in large groups. And I availed myself of the vet center right here in Brockton. So I'm very familiar with those issues. And as your sheriff, I will ensure that they are properly addressed so that we give everybody the best care possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you know, once again, uh, I'm uh, going to be speaking about the dedicated staff that we have over there at the sheriff's office that do this very thing, that are assisting people heading back into the community. Uh, we've gotten, with specifically with reference to, uh, to our veterans, we have essentially created a situation where we've got our own veteran service officer within uh, the correctional facility, and that individual's job is to assist employees seeking those benefits because we want to be conscious of their needs as well. But there are a plethora of services that are out there, as are correctly identified, uh, that are offered by the federal government. And for those individuals, you'd be surprised when people come in uh, as inmates, they often don't identify themselves as veterans for whatever reason. Uh, but we're able to find out the ones who are and may qualify for these great programs that we can get them into when they're released. I think the most important thing 
uh, that we're lacking at present as a criminal justice system in general is the fact that so many individuals who are coming out of our correctional facilities, that's Department of Corrections and the Sheriff's offices, lack post-release supervision uh, because they wrap up a sentence for whatever reason, there are many reasons that they do that, and there is no accountability on the outside. So we need to do two things, one of which we're very, very good at, and that's aligning people with the services that are available in the community, and I'd like to see us improve those. But I would like to see us have some changes in the sense that there is some accountability to somebody, not necessarily the sheriff's office, but somebody to supervise those individuals to make sure that they get into those programs and that they do what they're supposed to. Thank you. Thank you. Let that applause both candidates, please. Now I would like to welcome Felicia. Is Felicia here? Felicia Charles. Charles Mers. Charles. Charles. Good evening, everyone. So, um, welcome. As you know, um, my, well, let me just start from the beginning. My name is Felicia Chalmers. I'm a member of Messiah Baptist Church, a resident here in the city of Brockton, <laughs> and also a proud member of the big community. Um, as you know, um, one of our campaign strategies is um, to reduce the recidivism rate here in, Brock, in the city of Brockton. As you pretty well know, Brockton is the largest city in Plymouth County with, about, with a little over 94,000 residents and a 67% recidivism rate. So, <clears throat> and for those who may not know what recidivism is, recidivism is, is one of most fundamental concepts in criminal justice. It refers to a person's relapse often into criminal behavior after a person receives sanctions or undergoes um, intervention for previous crime. So starting with you, um, Mr. McDonald. My questions are, what is your understanding of the problem of recidivism and how it affects our community? What are your plans to reduce the, uh, the rate of, uh, of people returned to jail should you um, be elected for another term? And also, how are you going to work with the community to help fix the problem of recidivism? Thank you, that's a very good question and it's one that uh, we are wrestling with as a criminal justice system in general, in its entirety. Uh, I was very pleased, you know, Governor Baker has, uh, has done a very good job on these issues. Uh, I was uh, honored to serve on his uh, opiate working group. And after that concluded uh, with um, the legislation most recently passed, another group began. And this was a cooperative group between the governor's office, the Senate president, and the Speaker of the House. They brought in a national group known as uh, the Council of State Governments. And the Council of State Governments, this is called the Criminal Justice Reform Working Group. And I am one of three sheriffs that are sitting on this panel. Uh, and we are looking at exactly these, uh, these issues. And the most difficult thing for us to, to do at first is to quantify what they are because our definitions are different. What is a recidivating event. Now, most people would commonly say, well, someone commits a new crime, but there are many ways, and we want to make sure that we're using standard definitions, and the answer to this is programs. Programming to help the individuals with the issues that got them into jail in the first place, and programs to help them get jobs on the other side. What we're trying to do now, for the first time ever, is find out which of these programs are evidence-based, that they're working, uh, and which ones are, are not. And we want to use the evidence that we are able to adduce from this working group to make best practices that would be used not just in Plymouth County or the city of Brockton, but in all 14 counties in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I'm glad to be part of that effort and I'd welcome any ideas and hopefully maybe you can attend some of those meetings. Thank you. Okay. Uh, same question for you, Mr. Becky. Would you like for me to repeat them? No, no, I just had to look real quick. And the one thing I could say is that we could, we could listen and talk and define and do nothing for another 12 years, or as a gunnery sergeant of Marines, I'm a man of action. I see things, I see issues, and I act. 
One of the things that we need to do is we need to reduce recidivism. There's no need for people to continuously use the revolving door of justice. We, you could put a turnstile in front of the Plymouth County Correctional Facility right now with people coming and going from Brockton. And again, like I talked, I see them walking up the road with all of their belongings in a bag and five bucks for a bus ticket. When they get here, there's nothing for them. They get off the bus and where do they wind up? Over at Father Bill's at Mainspring, over in the park where we're having addiction issues. Significant things. That's why they need to, we need to have that safety net that I just talked about, the safety net where we involve the ministries, where they, people know that they're coming back to Brockton, where they have some hope that when they come back up to Brockton, maybe they don't have to take the bus, maybe there's somebody there to pick them up, but there's somebody that cares, and there's plenty of people, and I see them right there, that care. Combined with realistic job training on jobs that they can attain in the city of Brockton, to give them hope, partner them with those sponsors and the AA and NA program, so that if they do start to slide, somebody's there to catch them. Anything's, we're capable of anything with hope. And as a man of action, I won't sit and listen. I'll do and I'll act to reduce recidivism from day one in office. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Now, I would like to thank each and every one uh, who asked the questions. And I would like to thank the candidates who answered the questions very clearly. Now is the time to ask uh, for the closing remarks for each candidate. So I'm going to ask uh, Sherry Jerry McDowell to give his closing remarks uh, before we end uh, the program for tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it's been my great pleasure to be here. I thank the panel for the questions, and I thank everybody for coming out to listen to, uh, to what it is we had to say and have to say on some very important topics. As I said, uh, what I'm hoping here isn't simply a forum uh, that we come and we go from, but I hope what this is is a dialogue, a continuing conversation about what things are working, what things are working well, and what things are not. The sheriffs meet as a group. There are 14 of us here in Massachusetts, and every month we meet and we discuss things such as programs, what works, what doesn't. Our janitorial program that we just started and got two people placed into jobs, we got from Middlesex County. These are great things. We talk about these all the time. I'm looking forward to the data that we are going to reduce from the Criminal Justice Reform Working Group. I'm looking forward to seeing what programs we haven't thought of that come from other parts of the country that might be workable here. I'm also looking forward to giving them information. As I said, information goes both ways. What things are we doing here in Massachusetts that are working well that we can send to other states? This is important as well. And the bigger that that dialogue is, I think the better off we're going to be. There's a lot of things that we have to learn, and I've always said that the best ideas don't come from me. I am very, very blessed as I sit here today with a very dedicated staff. And I can't tell you how proud I am of the work that they do every single day. I, again, I would say that if anybody is curious as to what goes on, because I don't think we really got uh, a great picture of what it is, but I'd love you to come down to visit us for a tour, and I think you'll see some things that will impress you as well. So I thank you for your time and for your attention. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. In closing, I'd just like to say, I've talked a lot about my qualifications. Everybody knows that I'm the most qualified candidate for this job. But why do we need change? And I'll tell you exactly why we need change. Because 12 years ago, when Joe came into office, he railed against patronage, nepotism, employee campaign contributions, abuses of the pension system. You don't need to look far down at the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department to see the rampant, corrosive effect of employee campaign contributions that permeate every program. The janitorial program we just talked about, the last time I, I checked, had three inmates in it and nine supervisors only one of which was a correctional officer. The rest, we have a sergeant, we have all the way up to assistant deputy superintendents to teach three inmates how to use an expensive floor machine to strip buff and wax. Why? 
If you look to those people, I'm pretty sure that they all donated. And if nothing else, it just looks bad. When we both took our classes on professional responsibilities, what did they tell us in that class? If it looks bad, don't do it. Which is why I've sworn off employee campaign contributions, because they look bad. He railed against pension abuses and Charlie Lincoln. You all know Charlie Lincoln. He was a Brockton police lieutenant. Right now, there's 11 people exploiting the 960 loophole that are retirees, some of which <clears throat> retired one day, collecting 80% of their salary, and returned the next day at the same job, stifling upward movement within the correctional officers, but also exploiting that loophole to give themselves a raise, one of which gave himself a $20,000 a year raise the day after he retired. Thank you. My time is up, thank you. Hey. Before the closing remarks with Isabella, I would like to acknowledge a uh, few people here. We have uh, Lincoln Hyman, who is a candidate for uh, Plim County uh, Commissioner. And also we have uh, Mark Landy, Mr. Mark Landy, that school committee member. And also we have um, uh, some uh, counselors here, and I'm gonna, I would like to all of them to stand up. We have Wayne Fowell. Okay, and we have um, um, Mr. Larry. Where is Mr. Larry? John Larry, Jack. He's left too. Left. Okay, and also we have um, uh, Mr. Wadiges, Moses Wadiges. I would like them to stand so we can see him. And now uh, we have Shama, we have Shama um, Barnes. It's Shama Barnes, it's always a privilege to see you. And I would like to thank uh, each candidate for their presentation, for answering the questions tonight. Now I would like to call Isabel to come forward for the closing remarks. population and the race of, of recidivism in Brockton. We have done listening sessions and we have heard the cry of the community in regards to two disparities. We are confronted with addiction and economic exclusion and it is time to stand up to heal both. This issue is huge in our community and Right now, what we're doing is conducting canvassing, talking to the people in the community most affected. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. If you care about this issue, join us to educate the community because we believe a community educated is an empowered community. Join us. Join us to change the current unjust criminal system that is affecting, impacting many people, especially people of color. Join us. Join us every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Join us every Sunday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. to talk to most affected people in the community. Join us. Thank you. It is time to take action to stand up for our brothers and sisters, those that are the most impacted. Join us. Join us. Remember that we have uh, a deadline to uh, register to vote. If you remember and you haven't registered yet to vote, uh, October 19 is the, uh, the time, the day, so you can register to vote. And remember that uh, if you don't like a situation, uh, the only thing that you can do is to vote against it. That's all you can do. 
to change the situation, you have to go out to vote on number eight because to change the situation, something that you don't like, something that is not a good thing for it, our community, you vote against it to change it. So that's my word to you as a pastor, as a leader in the community, and we have to work together to make it happen. God bless you. And now, before we can, before we can go, I would like to ask uh, uh, Pastor Walker uh, to come forward to close it in prayer. Close the night for us in prayer. Okay. to pray. Ever living God, help us to remain ever vigilant, to join together, to champion the cause of what's happening inside penal facilities, to join together, not only for what we want, but for what is required of us to recognize the Imago Dei, the humanity of every person. In the name and through the power of thou who art the God, we trust you and let us go forth now, committed to join together with you and with one another. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Amen.